Everybody with Angela Williamson is made possible by Fireheart Pictures and viewers like you. Thank you. This month celebrates women by recognizing women's achievements over the course of American history in a variety of fields. Tonight, we honor a woman who is a veteran performer, who understands the business of movie making, and now we can add producer to her list of achievements. I'm so happy you're joining us. From Los Angeles, this is KLCS PBS. Welcome to Everybody with Angela Williamson, an innovation, arts, education, and public affairs program. Everybody with Angela Williamson is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. And now your host, Dr. Angela Williamson. I am honored to introduce our guest for tonight, Julie Carmen. Julie, thank you so much for being here and helping us celebrate Women's History Month. Thank you so much, Angela. I am thrilled to be here and Women's History Month is very important to celebrate. We hold up half the sky, they say. We do. Mm -hmm. And before we go into Julie, because we are going to talk about the documentary, which is why you're here today. Mm -hmm. um, but before we do that, I wanna talk a little bit about that PSA and why that is so important even now, because it, it was shot back in the in 90s. 94. Hermanos, gente, raza, people, barrios, hoods, guanacos, ticos, patos, chobos. You call us what you will. Raza, gente. Women, Latinas, mothers, daughters. Puerto Ricanos, Californianos, New Yorkans, Tejanos. Ugly one, pretty one, skinny one, fat one, tall one. Americanos. Citizens. Americans. Americans. Come together and vote. As a young actress, I uh, knew a lot of people in Hollywood and was able to call up friends. And in 1992, uh, then we were shooting on 16 millimeters, so I had to raise, I think it was $16,000 in order to shoot a 60-second PSA, which was called Latino Vote 92, which the Southwest Voter Registration Education Project said that it got a million Latinos to register to vote in California that year. And then in 94, I directed and produced and won Clio Awards for both of them, um, the Latina vote, and I had 108 women on a 60-second spot. Raquel Welch. Gloria Molina. Daphne Soniga. Liz Torres. Carmen Zapata. Julie Carmen. Rachel. Maddie. Nelly. Ada. Jennifer. Antonia. Sadie. Renee. Evelina. Yvonne. Diana. Lupe. Anna. Camilla. Vanessa. Nancy. Patrice. Esther. Rose. Ruby. Alma. Diane. Maria. Paula. Misha. Talaya. Patsy. Ivy. Ivy. Belle. Carmen. So we have both a 60 second, a 30 second, and then Rock the Vote didn't have any Latino spots. And, but somebody introduced me to uh, the head of Rock the Vote and he put it on the master reel so it went to the nine states that had the largest Latino population. So it actually helped move the needle a little bit. But when I look at it, I just see all of our hairdo from the <laughs> 90s and all of these friends. And it was a lot of work to write personal letters. There was no mm -hmm. internet back then. We had to write letters to everybody and inviting them all to be on the spot and to get and, uh, and a director named Luis Aira was my mentor and he helped me with the 92 spot in 94 I was able to direct myself so it's an interesting um, little background story well it's a very interesting yeah. background story because we know the Julie Carmen that we've seen on screen for many years doing these incredible roles, but I think it's really important to tell our audience how you started because you have such a unique background that made you such a legendary <laughs> actress in, in what you're doing even today. Thank you, Angela. I always feel invisible. I'm, I have such a beginner's mentality. I approach each day like I'm starting from scratch, but you know, I grew up in a, a very loving, supportive, family, um, 
I was born in New York and raised in the suburbs of New Jersey. I went to Essex County Community College uh, for a semester and then transferred to State University of New York. They had University Without Walls, Empire State College. So I was able to uh, dance and do choreography. I was the resident choreographer at INTAR, Cuban American Theater, um, when I was 17, 18 years old and did three plays for them, Yoruba, Espectáculo by Yenclan, and uh, The Shoemaker's Prodigious Wife by Lorca, um, because I grew up as a dancer. My grandma used to take me on the Erie Lackawanna train to South Orange, where I studied at the Garden State Ballet School, until uh, he said, well, my feet are much more built for modern dance. And I started to go into the city every, a few times a week on the, you know, the PATH train into Manhattan. We weren't far. And in those days, my parents really supported that kind of, uh, education. So I went alone into the city back and forth uh, in my early teen years, and um, it. And then I started auditioning for Off Off Broadway. Did a lot of Off Off Broadway. Mm -hmm. Did Broadway with Luis Valdez in Zoot Suit, and um, you know I, I showed up in my. Martha Graham outfit because I had studied at Neighborhood Playhouse and I was in a you know black onesie and everybody else was like in orange spandex <laughs> with like you know calf warmers and matching and, and it was a little intimidating and there were hundreds and hundreds of young ladies auditioning for Zoot Suit and then Luis Valdez hired me to be in the chorus and he also hired me to understudy the two female leads so oh. I was there I was on it I was raised with that kind of work ethic as an artist. And I think that that has um, paid off. Well, and yeah. I would love for you to talk a lot more about that work ethic because mm -hmm. with everything that I've seen you do, <laughs> you bring that 125 <laughs> or 80 percent from the day you, you, you step foot into a studio. And so how do you continue to do that? every day. There is something special about Julie that brings that every day. Oh gosh. Um, you know, this is familial. Okay. And one of the things that I'm going to talk about today is what we've identified as nine generations in our lineage of artists. Uh, you know, musicians, some, I'm, there are only two actors I've found, myself and my great aunt who lived with us for until I was 11. She was in Max Reinhardt's Midsummer Night's Dream playing Titania. And then she also, when she emigrated to New York, she was a nurse doing a massage in water with polio survivors. And so, you know, there was that bridge between health. There are a lot of doctors. My brother is an MD and doctor of public health and has run the occupational health clinic for 30 years at a big public hospital. So we have that in our family all through a lot of obstetricians and my niece is a neonatal ICU nurse. So I think when we go into our family lineage mm -hmm. and ask questions of anybody that is in your roots and say, what are the values? And we talked a lot about certain values and where are the heroes and heroines in our own family lineage and start highlighting those and you end up feeling like, wow, I'm lucky and I can s source all of that. So I, I was raised feeling if we're lucky, we have 100 years on this planet. Yeah. What do we want to do to move the needle so that good will prevail? And so you bring that to every project that you do is how can I, as Julie Carmen, move the needle? I do. I think about that. You know, some people rely on prayer. Some people rely on, on a dogma. I was raised Unitarian where we kind of find our own values and dogma and, and look for the goodness in people. We were raised in a very nonviolent household. We would sit and talk around the dinner table. Not to say that we didn't rebel. My brother and I were of the hippie generation and we lived, you know, 20 minutes from Manhattan. So we, you know, I got to see Jimi Hendrix and Janice Joplin and, and all these people at the Fillmore East. So we had a very, you know, early hardcore rock and roll upbringing too. But, um, you know, I think that we were able to sift out what we value. 
And I, I just don't want to feel like I'm on this planet to create more scarcity or to sap the resources or to hurt somebody because then that, that sits with us. It does. And I mean, what I've seen even with what you've done is not only just with your craft, but that you've taken the good from your craft and for example, you produce a public service announcement to tell people, get out there, vote, be part, make your voice mm -hmm. heard. And is that something that was talked about at the dinner table? Because I just, I love the way that your family instills this into you and your brother. Absolutely, yes. Um, my mom was an immigrant and she fled war and she was raised under bombs and in her schools were all bombed and she'd come up and there would be rubble. And so there's a kind of transgenerational transmission that happens when people have gone through, in early childhood, have gone through adverse childhood experiences. They now call it ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. And you need to mitigate them. You need to actually be conscious of what those experiences were and do the healing work so that we can move on a little bit lighter in, of heart and not always carry with us a sense of being victimized or hurt or traumatized. So. Uh, Yes, my parents were very much against war because uh, she was raised with it. My father was in the army, but because he has hay fever, he, he stayed stateside and he was a mambo teacher before he got married and he, then he was stationed in Florida, so I'm sure there was a lot of mambo there. Yes. But I grew up doing a lot of mambo in the living room and listening to Celia Cruz and uh, Montserrat Cavalle and all the great, great musicians. Well, we're, uh, believe it or not, we're almost done with this segment, but before we fit, I know it goes by so fast. Before we finish, there was something unique. Um, you talked about your grandmother and, and how she worked and she was a dancer and things. That's very, when I looked at your grandmother's history, I see the activism there in your family. So do you think that that has a lot to do with the Julie Carmen we see today and why, we'll talk more about it in the break, but why you're working on this documentary? Yeah, let me tell you quickly about the documentary yeah. that I'm working on. I, I, as an actress, I've done, well, on IMDB and the Internet Movie Database, they say 76 TV shows and, and films, but then in the middle of that, I took 15 years and was a licensed marriage and family therapist working one-on-one uh, -on -one doing psychotherapy. I got certified as a yoga therapist and I'm director of mental health at Loyola Marymount University Yoga Therapy Rx, which is a thousand hour certificate and I still teach there just 28 hours a year and it's spread out. But I created the first yoga therapy um, uh, supervised clinical practicum at Venice Family Clinic, where I was training the certified yoga therapist to work with behavioral health patients. Then during COVID, that shut down, and I said, I'm going to um, make a documentary film. My brother and I were brought to Cuba for the book launch of this about my great-grandfather who was a child prodigy pianist. His aunt was Catalina Berroa, uh, who was the first lady composer um, in Cuba, and my great-great-grandfather, and they were living in the 1860s, 70s, 80s in Trinidad de Cuba as free blacks because his father emigrated from Haiti, part of San Domingue, and the revolution there outlawed enslaving people much earlier. Uh, it was still legal to enslave people until 1886 in Cuba. And because of the sugar trade and the rum trade and Europe and the world was getting a, addicted to that. So this musicologist, Isidro Betancourt, republished my great-grandfather's compositions. And um, my great-grandfather was sent to study at 15 years old at, in Leipzig and his father played violin at the Gavant House. So he spent 11 years in Europe. They were the house musicians, the Trio Jimenez, then they called them the Neger Trio, because this was the era, era of human zoos in Europe. So they fled that, um, that movement and moved to France, where they were the house musicians at the Chateau Chenonceau. Then he went back to Cienfuegos and tried to open a music school. But it was like the Jim Crow era here. There was still enslavement of people in Cienfuegos because it was a main port. 
So uh, he was only allowed to teach out of his home, and he was called the father of Cuban lead. Lead music is classical piano and voice. And in the documentary that I'm executive producing for director Isidro Betancourt, we are recording the music for the first time and, and putting it out into the world because we wanted to, it's the opposite of erasure. I was actually Googling, what's the opposite of erasure? It's everybody has, everybody dies, yes. but there's certain people who've accomplished something that we want to highlight, that we want to um, bring, keep, keep it alive. And I feel because of race, it, this Jimenez Trio in the 1880s in Europe, they just weren't allowed to, to be known a, as the other romantic classical musicians. But Afro-Cuban classical music is, is a thing and we're bringing it back. Well, you know, that's a perfect way to end our segment because I want to come back and talk more about this and I want us to talk about how we can support you in okay. getting this story out. Fabulous. No two days are alike. So every day, you prepare. For yourself, for those you love, for whatever the day may bring. Being prepared is a part of who you are. But in the case of a disaster, preparation isn't always front of mind. In an emergency when help and resources may not be available for days, being prepared is more important than ever. It's up to everyone to be informed about what types of emergencies might occur where you live or visit. Knowing the best responses for your personal circumstances is the key to maintaining your health, safety, and independence. Make a plan that covers where you'll go in an emergency and how a personal support network can assist you. Build a kit that contains the specific things you need to survive for several days. Food and water, medication and supplies, as well as any important documents you may need. Being prepared is a part of who you are and disaster preparation is no different. There's no one more capable of planning for your situation than you. Be informed, make a plan, build a kit, get involved. Ready.gov slash my plan. Who was Lico Jimenez? In an age when classical music child prodigies were white, he was black. My great-grandfather, Jose Manuel Lico Jimenez Berroa, was born in 1851 in a house that stood here in Trinidad de Cuba. Lico studied piano with his aunt Catalina Berroa, the first woman conductor in Cuba. He was discovered playing piano at age 12 in this Palacio Cantero, where we filmed his descendants meeting for the first time to hear his music. And where local musicians and dancers helped us inaugurate this plaza. Welcome back. You just watched the trailer about Julie's great grandfather. Let's hear more about his music legacy and how we can support it. Well, making an independent documentary nowadays without a big studio behind you so that you can do it exactly as, as the family wants me to do it, um, it is challenging because you basically are shooting footage, editing footage on your own dime in the beginning. And then you put it together the way you want. You make something called a fundraising trailer. Yeah. And what I've shown you today is what I'm calling behind the scenes, the making of. And because you see us with masks on, yeah. I was in Cuba twice in, in 2022. Uh, to and, and right in the 
center of the pandemic and my son got COVID, my husband got COVID and it, the torrential tropical storms came. So you see us with umbrellas mm -hmm. and uh, everything was, was a big challenge. And right now, living conditions in Cuba, maybe because of the supply chain or because Russia is otherwise involved, uh, there, there, uh, no one is sending resources. So we found our long lost relatives and they didn't have band-aids, they didn't have blood pressure medication, they didn't have diabetes medication, they didn't have thermometers, they didn't have batteries, they didn't have light bulbs, they don't have running water and they live in a cinder block house, dirt floors, and you, to go in the backyard, turn on the spigot, you have to boil that water on, on a little burner for 11 people in the household. You have to boil it just to be able to freeze it to have drinking water. So the, the and, and doctors right now are, get $100 a month. So and it's a, across the board. So the living conditions right now in Cuba are really, really dire. And we f didn't know who our great grandfather's uh, Cuban family, we couldn't find them. My brother, being a doctor, he went to Cuba a few times. Uh, he's also a conguero and he, um, he played with the Muñequitos de Matanzas, and he right now plays at Lincoln Center with Joaquin Pozo, and he's a top Cuban conguero on top of, they call him El Doctor de la Rumba. And, um, but he, my great-grandfather, had a child while he was in Cienfuegos named Angel Zambrana, who had five children, and they had children. And we found them in 2022. And the documentary is about this reunification of the European branch yes. and the Cuban branch. And some live in Miami, some live in New York, some live here, some live in Tour France, Ibiza, Spain, Britannia, and Hamburg. So we're spread all over, but we brought them all as many as possible to this inauguration of the plaza where his house used to stand. And we inaugurated the plaza Jimenez Berroa Zambrana. And now we're going to, um, to La Coruña and recording the Ocho Canciones. These are Cuban lead eight songs, incredibly difficult. Uh, Maria Newman and Scott Hosfeld, who uh, are renowned classical musicians, her father won nine Oscars, uh, Alfred Newman, uh, they they played it we, in the in that trailer. You saw them playing it, and that was just sight reading. Um, it's very difficult music. So um, we're going to record it at, at in La Coruña, Spain, on April 20th, and we're raising money to help bring this story to light because we feel like Afro-Cuban classical music just hasn't had its day yet, and it's the opposite of erasure. So. You can help us with, um, we have a little GoFundMe campaign, any amount helps, and we're just, you know, gathering resources to help pay for the film, the editing, and our finishing funds. And this is definitely going to see, see the light. I even gave these two books to Gustavo Dudamel for his, um, it may, I don't know if his Venezuelan Youth Orchestra can play it, but we, we gave him these, uh, and their, their pictures in the trailer of us handing them to the head of, um, head of production at the LA Phil. And now that Gustavo is gonna be at the New York Philharmonic, um, we have a conductor in New York, Tanya Leon, who's Afro-Cuban. She's 80 and she just won the Kennedy Award. And she said she wants to uh, conduct it. She's a family friend. So we're, this is, I'm putting it out in the universe yeah. and that's why I'm here and you know, they say from from our lips to the universe may it happen. Yeah. <laughs> wow. This documentary is so needed right now and thank you so much for coming on the show to talk about the documentary and how we can help you. But before we end the show, um, there are two things I would love for you to talk about. One, What's next for Julie Carmen as the performer? Because you have uh -huh. so many things you're doing there. And then two, I'd love to tap in to your knowledge of how women can stay calm during life's moments. Um, during the pandemic, I was lucky to book a job on Grey's Anatomy. I, I was a triple organ transplant survivor and had a beautiful, 
scenes about uh, if I die during this surgery, I want to be a tree. I, I read that you can plant someone as a tree. And anyway, that was, uh, I loved working with Debbie Allen uh, because as a dancer, she has this dance academy. And I, I just have always looked up to De Debbie Allen and she directed our episode. And then I did La Doña in Tales of the Walking Dead, where, <laughs> where everybody's dying in Walking Dead. And I'm not a Walking Dead watcher much, but my character, who was 80 years old, they gave me a long gray wig. I still had chickens and food and water. And these two young people, ingenues, come into my house and want to take my house. And I, they watch me die, and they bury me in my backyard. And then I climb out of my own grave, and I basically pick them up and throw them into the ceiling and throw them on the ground and throw them out of my house. So it, I do Tai Chi, and that will segue us to how to stay calm. Okay, so I use my Tai Chi as La Doña, and anybody who does Tai Chi, they'll see in my movement where I take these people and I just throw them out. So it's, it's like <laughs> there's a certain move in Tai Chi. I do the Yang Style 108, the B side. We learned the A side every morning during the pandemic. I did Tai Chi on Zoom. My teacher and his mother both live in uh, Singapore. Um, but sometimes spend time in LA. And so it was on Zoom because of uh, COVID. And every morning at eight, we did the A side, 108 moves, and then we learned that. And then we did the B side, which is backwards. It's so good for the brain. If we each take responsibility for our own anxiety and not displace it onto the behavior of a spouse, a sibling, or a child, then I feel the household becomes more of a calm sanctuary. The world out there is tough enough. We don't need the, the home life to be an area of conflict. We want to respect our siblings so that they grow up and still love us and aren't angry about trauma from childhood. We want to respect our children so they don't grow up and say, oh, dad or mom did this and that to me and it was awful. So to be able to listen and be supportive so that person can go out into the world and do their best, I really am a big advocate of kindness and doing one's own inner work. Well, what a wonderful way to end our, our conversation. Julie, thank you so much, not only for gracing the screen and sharing your talent with the world, but you share it to make the world a better place by introducing us to your great-grandfather, creating public service announcements. You are truly a legend in all, so thank you so much, and thank you for spending time with us. <laughs> and thank you for joining us on Everybody with Angela Williamson. Viewers like you make this show possible. Join us on social media to continue this conversation. Good night and stay well.